Last episode, we discussed Italian and Russian use of the obsolete Vetterli rifle in the Great War. Now, let's explore whether or not this black powder antique can be transformed into a modern trench fighter. Hi, I'm Othias, and this, again, just barely fitting in frame, is an Italian Vetterli. Although now, we are on the model 70, 8715, a World War I adaptation. So let's get it over to the light box. With an overall length of 53 inches and weighing in now at 10.2 pounds, this gun is heavy duty. It has a magazine capacity of six 6.5 millimeter cartridges. Now, if this is the first time you've seen an episode from our show about an Italian Vetterli, then you're one episode behind. Because in the previous one, we went over a lot of detailed history on this particular gun, minus this particular magazine and cartridge. So, uh, if you're just too lazy to tune into that, let's do a very brief recap. This is the Vetterli Vitali 1870-87, a black powder charger-loading four-shot repeater born of a need to convert the previous model 1870 single-shot into a magazine rifle. Thanks to Vetterli's symmetrically locking lugs, it was able to make the jump to smokeless powder, although still at a lower pressure than the replacement rifle in Italian inventory, the Carcano which means from 1891 it was being displaced by Italy's new official rifle with its 6.5 millimeter smokeless cartridge and end block loading clips. Now, I just happen to have, oof, these things are huge, a uh, Carcano here, since we've talked about this rifle before, and oof, I've got the 10.4 millimeter Vetterli Vitali here. So I'm going to set both of these down where we can get a quick look, which takes a bit of juggling. And there we go. Can you guys see? Obviously, major differences between the two systems, but really what we care about in this particular is the magazine. In this case, the older Vitali used a oop, large caliber cartridge that was loaded four at a time from a charger. This whole thing went in, and then you stripped it back out. Now, the Kakano uses a six round end block clip. This whole thing, here, let me get it back into focus just a bit. This whole thing would go in and down and stay. And when the last round was chambered, the clip would fall out of this bottom ejecting hole here. This was much more rapid. And also you can load it from either direction and you don't have to do any weird cord yanking and tossing stuff aside. Just boom, press steel right out the gate. Very simple construction. So, uh, like we covered in our last episode, that difference, that radical difference in ammo, meant oh, that you had to have two whole supply networks running if you wanted to have two different cartridges. I mean, not really, it's one transportation network, but you'd have to constantly eke out a small lot of 10.4 for every big lot of 6.5 if you wanted to put the Vetterli Vitali anywhere near the front line. And so that meant that that gun stayed in rear, rear echelon use where it wasn't expected to have to create a constant stream of fresh cartridges to the front. Whew. Okay. All that, previous episode, now we're up to today. So I can go ahead and put this guy back on the table because we're gonna move into the direction of this particular gun. Honestly, the biggest users were in the colonies, namely African Ascari. Now that would have been the end of the line for the Vetterli. It would have just gone to the four shot version, a uh, handful in rear echelon, colonial use, and nothing much else. Oh, and from our last episode, I'm sorry, they served with Russia and a little bit with Romania and some training in Germany. Just backline whatever. This was a gun who was not going to have a new story at the end of its lifespan, except for the fact that in 1915, from Italy's perspective, war were declared. I don't think I need to tell you again. This is a war of attrition. We try to wear out the other guy because there's just no solid 
breakthrough. Everyone is capable of presenting defense in depth and rearming by rail so fast that any outbreak is not really a threat to the entire line. Tactics would change that towards the end of things, but not at the beginning. And so, uh, beans, bullets, and rifles started counting for a lot. Now, in order to free as many Carcano to the front as possible, Italy would leverage the Vetterli Vitali. But just like we said, uh, you really don't want to try to mix up you know, this and these in the same supply chain, it's just gonna be nightmarish. And also, if you start putting this on the front line, you have to produce this. And to produce this, you have to take down uh, men and machines that would be capable of making more 6.5. So realistically, you don't want to put an old cartridge into production if you don't have to, when you could burn it all up on ammo that could be used by your current machine guns and current rifles. So 6.5 was going to be the ticket. The big question, however, is can we make use of these Vetterli Vitali in our new cartridge? Just to review, here is the 10.4 millimeter cartridge. It was originally black powdered, turned to smokeless in 1890, a big bore, slow and heavy hitter. It had been replaced in 1891 by the bottlenose 6.5 millimeter smokeless powdered service cartridge. This is light, fast and flat shooting, very modern at its adoption, although technically being a bottlenose, it fell behind the Spitzer curve. You've seen a whole episode on this already though. So as we already know, the Vetterli has a really good rear locking bolt for its time, 1870. Uh, we saw a close up of that thing. It's two symmetrical locking lugs, very secure. They're at the rear of the action. Front locking is more common by this time. However, don't shame the old Vetterli on that one because when it was adopted, it was black powder. And black powder fouling meant that front locking lugs, they were known, they were a thing, people knew to do it. It's just that if you did it, any repeated fire would result in fouling, and then you just end up with jammed up lugs in a messy breach. It's easier to put them all the way at the rear, away from all that dirt and dust. And yeah, you lose some strength, but realistically, these are lower pressure cartridges. It's not a big deal. So really, for the time, the Vetterli locking action is about as good as you could possibly get in 1870. I mean, it was fantastic, which means it was just strong enough to handle the load of 6.5 by 52 millimeter Carcano ammo. I say just barely because uh, as evidenced by our own experience, there's a limit, especially a hundred years later. So before I go any further, I want to make sure I say very clearly, don't go out and fire commercial loads through the gun we are discussing today. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Anyway, returning to the history, if Italy wants to use the good old black powder rifle, they're gonna have to do something about this big bore barrel. Now, uh, generally when we see conversions, we see that they just remove the barrel and create new ones in the cartridge they want. But just like with not wanting to set up a whole line of production for you know, uh, 10.4 millimeter cartridges all over again, because those facilities could be used for the new ammo, you don't really want to set up barrel makers. I mean, that is a very refined skill. Barrel straighteners, uh, people who are doing like the steel castings and the quality of that steel and then the milling and the precision involved. And it, it is art, science, and it is very difficult. So if you have the facilities to make a barrel, do you want to make any that aren't going to the front line? Do you really want to take that time if you do not have to? And so that becomes the question. How many resources, how much time, money, whatever, of limited, limited resources do we want to put towards taking a black powder rifle and making it into a frontline rifle? Well, luckily, there was an invention right in time for this particular problem that would solve the whole mess. The solution came from Giuseppe Salerno, who patented a barrel retubing process. In this way, you can reline an existing barrel or convert a larger bore to a smaller one. Interestingly, towards the end of the war, the British would actually adopt this system for Warren Vickers barrels. Now, the Salerno method will reappear in a number of places like, say, Finland. So I want to make sure I point out that this is not just a bore it out and stick a smaller tube in there. It's actually quite involved, but still very efficient and reliable. You start with an original oversized or worn barrel. Bore it out and then add reversed steps. These will keep the inner barrel from walking out when firing. 
Now insert a steel tube with matching steps. The bore of this tube is actually smaller than the final caliber and still smooth at this point. Now you will force hardened steel rods through the tube, each slightly bigger than the last. This stretches and press fits the tube into the barrel, fusing them together. Now bore out that tube and rifle it. Bingo, bango, you are done. All right, so that means that the rifle can now chamber and fire the 6.5 millimeter cartridge, mostly. We'll need to modify the bolt as well, but I'll show you that in a moment. Now, the other problem with it is the magazine. Well, luckily, the Carcano is a rifle that was sort of paired with a Monlicker magazine to begin with, so we can just take that Monlicker style magazine and shove it on our new gun, replacing the old Vitali magazine. And so, what you ultimately end up with is the gun that I showed you at the top of the show, this rifle right here, the Vetterli Vitali, no longer Vitali, and I guess you could say Vetterli Carcano, but the magazine's technically a Mon Licker, so I think people just go with Vetterli. It's easier. So the Vetterli slash Carcano slash Mon Licker slash no longer Vitali, although we vaguely have some Vitali features left over in the safety, there's a lot of names. This is the 70, 87, and now, because of the modification, 1915. 15. So, uh, without getting too confusing, I think it's time to get a closer look at what all was done to change up this rifle. So, number one, uh, I can get up the original gun and do some, some comparison, but I want to trust you guys' memory just a bit because these are very awkward to maneuver. So, first things first, this big ejection port is a little bigger. It's been widened out to make sure that we have all the room for our new longer cartridge, see? Short, long. All right, when we open her up, oh, we'll see that we have a regular Carcano style follower and magazine and it ejects from the bottom. By the way, some of these are flush. Some of these have this stamping here. I believe it's to improve strength and probably part of holding on to it in the manufacturing process. However, I haven't seen any real documentation on exactly why and exactly why this shape. Now, uh, a lot of stuff came off of this gun in order to get where it is. We have our Salerno barrel put in, and we have extra milling taken out. We have our magazine cut off is removed. See, as I turn this, there's nothing moving down in here like the previous gun. Well, that's because it now does only one job, which is to hold in the cross key. So you would take this to align it up, push this guy out, and you'll get your bolt out. Um, as a matter of fact, I can go ahead and just do that at the moment and set her aside. We'll get there in just a second. The old Vitali safety stayed around. The rail is here. Good old trigger guard, all the usual familiars, but our big changes are going to be kind of hard to spot. So, bigger opening. Down in here, there used to be those springs on either side that were holding the cartridge, if you guys can recall. And they, as I specifically pointed out last episode, were screwed in up here and you can see the notches in the stock. Well now, there's just holes. And just holes back here, and plenty of places for gas to leak out. That's going to be kind of important for later. I'll tell you why in a bit. Now, let me back this guy up, and you'll see that we have a new rear sight. This is getting back towards being more like the Vecchi sight. It's got a single spring on the side. It's a quadrant style, and it's adjustable all the way up to, good lord, a generous 2,000 meters. And at the very base, it's marked for 275. So that means you're going to take a little uh, Kentucky range on this because if you're shooting under 275 meters, she's hitting a little off on the vertical. Okay, so if I spin this guy around and get her back into your view, we'll see that we have a new cleaning rod, thinner for a 6.5 millimeter bore. And you can see our tiny bore, and if you really were to look, and I don't think it's going to show up on this video, if you were to really look, you might see a bit of a line where the two were fused together. The original bayonet lug is retained, and... Whoa, I should probably point out, I'm sorry guys, right in here, the old Vitali magazine was wider and shorter. So while they could cut the wood away to get the length for this, they had to fill back in wood on the width. So you can see right there, a little wood fill and a little wood fill. These plugs actually are not always well fitted and on many of the surplus guns I've seen, they've managed to crack or rot their way out and just left a gap. So always keep an eye out for any spiders that might want to be living in your rifle. Uh, this thing still, by the way, will release an M-block clip early by pressing on this button here. Uh, I don't have any dummy rounds at the moment. I misplaced them. These guys are live, so I'm not going to shove them in there. But you'll get the idea, and you'll get to see May play with it in a moment anyway. All right, so oh, let me set this guy aside without knocking out a lamp and pull out 
the bolt again. Now, there's not much point in taking this apart because internally it's dang near identical from the last episode, but I want you to see right on the face, they've recessed it. So originally this was a flush fit bolt. They've set it back by a few millimeters. They've shortened up the firing pin and actually the bolt forms part of the support for the cartridge. So she sits down in there and let me tell you, if you aren't head spaced on these guns, you can get a case head separation very easily. Now, I know from all of that, you're thinking, okay, this seems like a lot to do. Uh, it's definitely not nothing. So you're gonna need to put some men on it. It's gonna take time away from regular rifle manufacturer, right? Like that's a thing. Well, the answer is sort of, because as much as there's a lot of things to do this gun, there are things that can be done by repair depots or smaller commercial concerns. You don't need to be a big rifling or a big rifle manufacturing company to get this stuff done. As a matter of fact, the hardest part is the Slurno process itself, and then maybe straightening that up just a little bit when you are done. Really, really, really not a lot of work and not a lot of expense to get what was a supply chain nightmare rifle into an absolutely compatible gun that you can take your preloaded in block clips as they were shipped, shove them right in. It's quite good actually. Now, this isn't the only version of this particular gun. There are actually uh, three variants, although there may only have been two in the war. It's a little tricky. For certain, there was the Fuchile 1870-8715. That's the gun I've been waving around. And limited production of a shortened Moschetto da Truppe Speciale Modello, again, 70-8715. But a third example has been noted in museum collections. The Moschetto da Carabinieri Modello, again, 70-8715. I think you get the pattern here. Uh, this gun's interesting because it was never actually converted to 87, so I'm not sure why they retained that number. You'd think it would be the 70 15. Uh, it jumps straight from a single shot with no magazine to this Monlicker slash Kakarno magazine. And of course would not need those extra wood fill pieces. It was just bolted right in. And then a number of updates were made. Now on that last one, author Robert Wilsey, whose book I recommended last time and I will reiterate, I recommend it now. It is available now. It is a new book. It is printing. You know what I mean? A lot of the stuff I've recommended, you got to pay top dollar and find an old copy of. This one's available. This is an active author who's put a lot of work into this. He has put more work into it than I have. I've, I mean, I put a lot of work in the episodes, but I touch on a gun at a time. I work off of the backs of other people who work off the backs of other people, I'm sure. But my heroes are the authors. These guys put a lot, years and years of effort into one gun. And then I get to come along like the silly thing I am and just get a bunch of attention for repeating what they wrote. And that's good for you guys that don't want to know everything about the gun and want a tour of the war. But if you, let's say, own one of these rifles, there's really not an excuse to not own this book. It's gonna tell you way more than I can in this episode. Way, way more, and with a lot more and better photos. The man is awesome. Anyway, buy the book. Book aside, I think we've covered the walk up to this gun. It's really not as complicated as some of the other stories. They had an available rifle, they wanted it in a different cartridge, and they came up with a pretty smart way of making that conversion. So I think it's fair to get a look inside of this gun and see how it differed from the last one. All right, let's load this guy up. See, this time it's the Carcano and block clip. This will stay inside the rifle, forming the feed lips of the magazine. It stays put thanks to this latch, which can be depressed to unload the rifle, but we're not doing that now. The rest of this is really the same Vetterly action, except this bolt body has been recessed at its face to fit the 6.5mm cartridge. From here, the gun is very straightforward, and if you saw last episode, you know more than enough about what's going on here. I will say, watch this end block once more, because as we chamber the last round, it will fall away. That's a wrap, and it's time for May.
lad, you'll love to tell her in the house or out. You know, some of you might have noticed some extra language during that video segment. I certainly hope you did because, good lord, be careful with these guns. And I say that because in all of the show's history, this is the first rifle to catastrophically fail. And uh, sadly, it's the second rifle to also catastrophically fail. We had one example of this gun that we took to the range and, well actually I shouldn't even say that, we took our time because so many of these guns, when you get one, be very, very careful. The chambers almost always seem to have rust in them. Of four or five examples, uh, I'd say, well okay, if it was five examples we've seen, it's four had the rust, I, I'm trying to recall. But rusty chamber, for whatever reason, seems to be common. Be very careful, you don't want to just shove around in there. If the headspace is walked out, as I said, there's so much support coming from the bolt, it can blow out the case. I will tell you how I know that in a moment. So, first gun that goes down is we're running 85% load because on a gun this long, you really don't want to walk too far back on your load because if it squibs, that's a bigger problem than just maybe a little overgassed, right? As long as we're not cracking lugs. And then we crack lugs. So, <laughs> at 85% load, we got two, three mags through it, uh, testing, people trying it out, and then starting to film. And then... Uh, May noticed that, thankfully, she wears glasses because she was getting some hot gas in her face and it was becoming difficult to work the bolt. That's because it had developed a hairline crack through the collar. As a matter of fact, I should have a photo here. That was rifle number one. Rifle number two uh, meant that we had to clean up another gun, go through a whole bunch of little things to make sure it was running right, check for, you know, movement and play, check the chamber casting, yeah, I got it. Get it out to the indoor facility run a 70% load this time because hey if it took 85 you know percent with 18 cartridges plus maybe 70 will be just fine we definitely don't want to accidentally squib the bore so we're worried about going lower than that uh rig it get the trigger pulled and another failure this time uh, case head separation. The pressure vented into the firing pin hole as best I can tell because it actually managed to turn the bolt back up and partially unlock the action. I would imagine it should have been an out of battery shot for that to happen, but I know for a fact I had that bolt all the way down. I am certain of it. And then once she was released, uh, thankfully not with any of us too close, uh, up and partially back. Once it got just enough room to let the gas vent into the atmosphere, it was happy. Although a lot of that vented into the holes left behind by the old magazine spring interrupters. So that means all of the gas vented into the stock line. So the stock exploded and sent wood shrapnel everywhere. Okay, that's two Vetterly rifles down. Now we move on to a third Vetterly rifle and just for good measure, we take uh, the still intact locking components out of one and hand fit them to the stock that was still good on the one with the cracked lug. So now we have two of these guys up and running and we walk ourselves down to a 50% load. This worries us because we don't want to squib. So we have to then test these loads to make sure we consistently get rounds out and don't end up with a squib. We have to count every round as it goes into paper. We tested on two rifles. They both handled it just fine. So if you're vaguely curious, 50% load seems to work for us. Here's the thing. When we were on range firing this, we still had a dedicated person 
watching the target for each and every round. And his job was, should there not be a hole after each shot, then he is to yell. Because we did not want to stack squibs in this gun. 50% load seems... It seems a little tricky when you have a barrel this freaking long. So we really want to make sure we had no problems. I just don't recommend making a habit out of shooting this gun if you own one. By the time you get down to what we feel like is a safe pressure, you're risking other problems. Just, you guys have your own best judgment. Big disclaimer on this episode, we don't encourage you to backyard this one. Take your time, know what you're doing, and especially count your shots when you are firing a Vetterly. <sighs> okay. Just for good effect, as a last reminder, Look at the damage one more time. All right, let's get back to history. These guns were produced by various workshops and were often marked on the butt stock with the shop and the year. These include Officine di Costruzione de Artiglieria. Oh my God, guys, I don't speak Italian. Fab de Army de Roma, Officio Provisorio de Artiglieria, Gardon VT or Valtrompia. Uh, that might also be spelled this way. I'm not even saying that one, guys. And then also S. Poloti e Figli, although that one was likely from 1930s refurbishment because the firm doesn't seem to exist before then. I am well aware that some of you turn in just to hear me butcher your native languages. You're welcome. I'm terrible at it. Oh, anyway. So, roughly 400 thousand of these guns were assembled in very short order with very low expense and that makes for a very good emergency rifle. Now I should also point out that they were paired with a bayonet and yes they can take the original Vetterly bayonets but that's not super modern right? The Carcano came out with a shorter bladed bayonet we should probably modify those as well into basically two patterns. I'm actually unsure if one of these came first and the other second, or they were both produced concurrently, but you may find either a 12.4 inch blade or a 10.9 inch one. In the case of the latter especially, it was common for the remaining blade length of the original bayonet to be turned into a fighting knife. I'm sure you guys can kind of guess where these rifles belong. Somewhere near the front line, somewhere that would have been in the mobile supply network but not necessarily on the front lines. I mean, you're not really gonna wanna be putting 100, 200 rounds a day out of something like this. So, uh, realistically, artillerymen and transportation and communications and blah, 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 blah. But interestingly, they were very strongly associated with one particular organization. That would be the Militia Territoriale. This was sort of an Italian home guard, established to protect vulnerable points like bridges, rail lines, and communications hubs, and tasked with prisoner transport, things like that. Stuff you want to be armed for, but not necessarily as well organized, and not necessarily as young or healthy as the rest. Because of the occasional breakthrough or complete lack of manpower on the Italian front, this force would occasionally see, well, direct combat. But that was not the norm. Now, outside of that, these guns had a pretty big role out in the colonies. They were especially favored for handing over to Ascari because uh, this is also sort of more of a post-World War I thing, although I couldn't say when they really started making their way down to Africa. Uh, you have these sort of levies in Africa. Uh, some of them are well-trained and loyal, and you would happily give them a Carcano, and some of them are a bit dicey. And so you want to give them limited ammo or limited rifles. Now, previously, you could have handed them, and they often did, a uh, Vetterly in 10.4. And then there'd be plenty of 6.5 ammo laying around for the Italians to use. But if it ever got captured, well, it's not so useful in the old 10.4. And then you just sort of ration these big bullets for those guys. But at some level, that still is two things in the supply network. It's a pain in the butt. And if you have a rifle that has a tendency to fail after being used... A couple hundred times with your actual ammo. I can't prove the Italians were hyper aware of this, but I'm pretty aware of it, let me tell you. Uh, it's pretty good to give the inferior, heavy, possibly self-destructive rifle to the guys you don't necessarily trust to stick around after a few months of, you know, not being paid attention to directly. So the idea that they would go off with pop guns that'll eventually pop back makes you not so worried about losing large reserves of ammo if it's ever taken in the field. Um, so this would get handed down to not the best guys, and you would keep back the Carcano for the best guys, and you still get to use one type of ammunition. So 
that's not so bad. As a matter of fact, it's pretty apparent when one of these guys has been down in Africa because a lot of them were marked with a certain brand, AOI. This stands for Africa Oriental Italiana, Italian East Africa. This branding shows up around 1936, so that makes us pretty aware of these guns being in service then and on into the 40s. Honestly, their service life in Africa was halted by Allied forces and Ethiopian forces pressing Italy back off the continent. Now, as part of that conflict, I will say that these were also captured by the British in regions like North Africa, although not quite as often as Carcano, they still seem to have wandered into a number of fields of combat. So this really was the sort of out of town, disposable Italian rifle for a number of years and certainly puts it into the category of a light duty World War II rifle as well. All right, so I'm gonna put this guy down. Let's move on to some basic math before we get over to May. Roughly 1.6 million veterally were made, and around 1.3 million of those were still intact when World War I started in Italian service. Some may have been surplused out or given away before that. 400,000 or so made it to Russia. 400,000 or so became 6.5 millimeter rifles like this one, serving with Italy at home and abroad. Another 150,000 or so were sold to the Chinese warlords. We mentioned that last episode. And that leaves us somewhere around 350,000 in the wind. Now, recall from last time, we don't know if the Italians or the Russians supplied them to the Turkish nationalists. And a lot of the guns were sort of on embargo the entire time they were being surplused out. So it may just be that they were given away and not properly tracked. It may be that they were consumed in some way by Italy. It may be that somebody has a really weird collection in their very large basement. I unfortunately just can't account for those guns. So uh, everybody keep your eye out for a really weirdly cool hole in the ground. Now, uh, with that resolve, let's go ahead and take this, oh, Victorian turned World War I turned World War II colonial rifle and hand it over to May once more to get her opinion on what it's like to shoot an antique rifle in the Great War. You are not watching a rerun. This is a different gun from last time. It's just hard to tell. So I'm gonna put this over in May's hands and get her opinions on handling the new Model 15, 70, 87, 15. I think we can shorten this to 15 without confusing anybody. The smokeless 6.5 Italian Vetterly made specifically as an emergency rifle in World War I. What is different handling this gun from the last one? Man, guys, it is, it's so different. It's like an entirely different horse here. No, seriously, there's really no difference. Like, I mean, in terms of length, weight, it's all still there, handling somehow worse. Good job, I've handled four of these guns and all four of the actions were crap. So that's not great, that did not get any better. But to be honest, I think that's more to do with the wear on the guns due to their post-war use, like in Africa than it is for the gun itself. So I wish I had a really nice version of this, but I haven't ever seen any of these nice or pretty. So they always look like crap. So let me know if anyone finds a pretty one out there somewhere. Um, yeah, the magazine is obviously bigger. doesn't stick out uh, from the bottom as much, but is overall bigger mag. Um, doesn't really detract or add anything. Just a thing to note, I suppose, for the ergonomics. Um, and the other thing that's really different are the sights. These are stronger feeling sights. They are, they definitely don't feel like they're going to bend or break easily. So nice, good job. They at least made sure to uh, make them less dingable, I guess. So hooray, I get to actually aim and shoot at what I'm aiming at for once. That's good. So I like that. But yeah, ergonomics wise, there's really not that much difference from the black powder version. I will say you have forgotten one distinct and wonderful feature about this gun over the other. It's probably like a pound and a quarter heavier at the muzzle. <laughs> God, yeah, how could I forget that? Oh, gee. Mm, anyway, so, uh, may I? I will point out that I earlier said that we found a lot of these with, like, rusty chambers, and we found a lot of these with rusty chambers. I feel like because of the 6.5 ammo, these may have been fired just as often, or maybe even less often than the 10.4s, I can't say, but I have a feeling, based on our experience, that the full power, 100% 6.5 ammo of the day, might have been slowly working them out of spec. I think there's a little bit of mashing that went on in these guns just from what little use they had, or maybe a lot of use later on, because we certainly saw a couple failures. So, um, 
You're obviously alive, so that part went well. Hooray! Would you like to tell us about your experience, the best possible experience, shooting this in 6.5? And maybe we'll talk a little bit about what when it didn't go so well. So, uh, first things first, assuming everything goes well, what's it like firing this gun in the Great War in 6.5? Well, when it goes well, it actually does go bango, at least. That's good. Um, but yeah, so this one instead has an in-block loading. Honestly, I thought with either the loading or with cycling rounds, I was going to get some sort of jamming in this gun. Not a single one. It actually functioned perfectly on that one, even with the action being as stiff as it is. Even with nothing loaded in there, notice how stiff that was. But yeah, surprisingly, loading the cartridges, it did fine. And cycling them again did fine. Um, the sights, they are indeed better. Not only are they more resilient, but they also are, I guess, just sharper. So I really feel like I got a nice, good, strong sight picture. There's no question on where I'm aiming with this gun. Honestly, I feel like you could bench shoot this like a sniper rifle and you would be dang accurate with that target. I mean, you saw on range, it, it honestly, the target just looked like I was shooting any other old long rifle that we have in the collection, um, which was really nice. Uh, like I said, the action, terrible. Yeah, it actually got stuck there for a second. Good job, May. Anyway, uh, and then pulling the trigger, really not that much of a difference in the triggers. It's still kind of creaky, still not great. Um, the recoil. So I first shot 90% loads where it was just 10% reduced in terms of the load. Those weren't bad. Like the recoil, there was nothing. And then I shot, you know, half loads. Again, nothing. Recoil on these guns is nothing because there's just so much weight in here that really mitigates that. So yeah, you could probably shoot this one all day if you can hold it up all day or if you're on a bench somewhere. So that wasn't too bad. But, uh, yeah, shooting wise, when it functions and goes bango, it did all right. Now, I know some of you are going to say, whoa, 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 if it was so light on the recoil, what was with all that reset time between shots? And I'm going to have to go with May on this. All the problems in this gun actually have to do with how long and heavy that barrel is because any bump, even a little one, and you end up having to carefully, like, you have to, you know, Tai Chi it back into position. You have to keep enough tension in here to keep it from walking. And so it's not so much that the recoil puts you off, it's that the gun itself puts you off. I mean, you could have a ton of recoil or very little recoil, and I don't think either would change very much. You're mostly just fighting that muzzle. Weight. Yeah, honestly, I was just trying to be as accurate as possible with these shots, so it was taking me a little bit longer than I anticipated with it. All right, so I know some of you are curious. May managed, I think, like four or five shots with the 90% load. And then we had a gas rupture, which made us curious. And from the gas rupture, we also noticed that the poor handling got a lot worse. And when we stopped, as we always do when we have problems, and took everything apart, we found that we had a cracked, uh, well, technically it's the bolt handle plus the locking lugs are all one part. So yeah. it had failed and we could no longer shoot that gun. So that's why she had experience with 90% load and then began the game that I've already talked to you about trying to figure out what was a balanced load for safety and yet still managing to clear the muzzle also again for safety. And so we managed to walk down to 50% and you shot it the rest of the way that way. Now we had, that means we had two targets because this is over separate days. Uh, and we ended up with a target with like four holes in it and a target with six holes in it. And I will tell you guys now, not a huge difference between the two. I didn't really think to document the, I don't know why, but when we scrapped it, I didn't realize how close we'd be and that I'd need the target picture later. But actually, weirdly, at this short range, very little change in our hit. So roughly the same distribution. So you can speak to the accuracy of this gun. It felt say average? Yeah, it really, there really wasn't that much of a difference. Honestly, I didn't, there was no perceivable difference for me, even though, yes, I went out there on a separate day. But yeah, guys, honestly, there, there's really no difference between the size of the load because this heaviness of this gun, it just, it takes all of it away. Yeah, I would say all the looseness in that grouping was from exhaustion more than anything else. The, the Salerno method has been proven to produce a very accurate barrel. And, you know, I think it's down to the action being loose that makes these worse. So I have to ask you, Will you take something like that into a Great War battlefield with any confidence whatsoever? Yeah, so, uh, this really still has a lot of the similar problems the Black Powder gun had, in which there's still a lot of weight and length to this gun. The balance is off. I really wasn't super keen on the action. Being as stiff as it is, I'm, again, gonna try not to hold that against it. I guess if I try to think of a newer version, sure, it probably would have done much better. 
But overall, it's still the same problem in that I've got much better options at that time than this guy. So for that reset time that it's going to cause me on this one, I really just don't feel confident taking it into battle and feeling like I'm going to come back surviving it. So this one is just going to get a, get a no in my book. How about you, Athias? Do you want to talk about your experience with these guys and how you'd feel about taking it into battle? I think what May is getting at is that two of these guns failed on us. A cracked lug and then, like I said, an exploded stock. So... As the only firearms to not fail even one, we have none that have failed once. Like we've had, I mean, we've had some incidents. We have like you know, uh, a old spring that snapped or collapsed or something. Like something that had a hundred years of hard use and it was a part and we replaced it and we got it run. The only gun that has ever been close to this unreliable has been the Pedersen device, and then we had a whole episode on that. So this is the first one to explode. Number one, and number two. It's the first one to sort of explode twice. Like, it's not just that one failed, it's that we had two separate incidents of these guns failing. And so I would urge extreme caution with these rifles if you have one. They do not have good gas mitigation systems. As a matter of fact, like I said earlier, the gas will vent into the stock if it gets the chance and that will hurt. Uh, I highly recommend dealing with a trained ammo hand loader and taking due care i just i don't see these as shooters i'm so sorry like i just don't see them. by the way beautiful pieces of history absolutely undervalued in the market at the moment by all means if you'd like to hang one that's fine and if you'd like to very carefully do what you do have a gunsmith handy i don't i don't want emails of photos of your gun trying to get me to give you a note here's the thing by the way this is unrelated to the veteran i just have to say this while i have everybody's attention I will never tell you, yes, it's safe to shoot a gun because I will get sued for that. I am a knowledge expert and then they can haul me into court and say, he said I said I could shoot it and now I got one eye. I'll never say yes. I will say go to your gunsmith. So I will save you the email. Go to your gunsmith. All right. That guy you can deal with. So I'm not going to email diagnose your gun. All right. Liability aside, I actually, I'm not ashamed to own one of these. I actually think they're a beautiful piece of history. It's... It, if you're thinking of the Great War and the war of attrition and the desperation and the need for firearms and all that, there's hardly a better, more iconic gun to put on the wall than a Vetterly 15. Like, there's nothing else that's going to say, look how hard this conflict was. People took these into the fight. It's fantastic. Just wouldn't really want to put one out as my bug out gun. Right, do you have any other words about this beautiful, no longer black powder, but smokeless rifle? Uh, no, other than I probably am going to avoid shooting one ever again if possible, just because I've had such poor experience with them. So, neat. I'm going to hang it on my wall, but I don't think I'm going to shoot it if I can help it. All right, well, with that, really probably the worst, most abysmal uh I didn't like gas in my eyes, all right? It kept spewing at me. I'm not okay with that. <laughs> all right. So, worst gun yet, you guys are always trying to track the top. You know, you haven't started tracking the bottom yet, but, you know, we could give you that and a Reich's revolver and just make you happy for a whole afternoon. Yeah. So, uh, we always have the updates after the credits. Stick around. Thanks for tuning in, and I'm glad to have you. Later, everyone. Alright guys, I'm going to keep this a little brief because the pollen is out and I am all sniffles and tears. We have nearly reached 100,000 subscribers, but this last little 5,000 has been really slow. So, if you know anyone who might like this show, now is the time to recommend it. Also, just a heads up for you guys only following us on YouTube, we've been dropping these new concise info card images on our social media lately, so you might want to take a look for us over at Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook to keep up. Alright, as always, thank you for watching.